All right, so we are moving on to chapter 11. This is the last chapter that we are going to work on. And we are going to basically combine everything we did in chapters 9 and 10, but with two sample populations. Before we can get started, we, of course, have to discuss independent and dependent samples. And then we are going to go through how we test hypotheses for two proportions that are independent. And then we will construct a, a confidence interval between those two proportions. And we will determine a sample size as necessary. we know if we have independent or dependent sampling? Well, a sampling method is independent when an individual selected for one sample does not dictate which individual is to be in a second sample. Basically, a lot of times we have random sampling. If I pick random people for the first one and then say random people for the second one, that is most likely to be independent. A sample is dependent when the individuals selected in one are used to determine the individuals in the second sample. So I pick all these first people randomly, but the second person has to be a sibling or a spouse. So there's a relationship or I pick the first person and the second person has to be living in the same town. There's some sort of relationship that determines who the second sample is coming from. You can also use yourself with like a pre and a post, um, uh, also called a matched pairs. So you can use a pre and a post type thing. Just to kind of go through here, we're going to decide first, are we independent or dependent? And then is it a qualitative or quantitative? variable that we are working with. All right, the GDC decided to implement a course redesign of its developmental mathematics uh, program. Students either enrolled in a traditional lecture format course or a lab-based format in which lectures and homework are done using video and the course management system, My Math Lab. So basically what you're doing here with my stat lab. There were 1,200 students enrolled in the traditional lecture format and 300 enrolled in the lab-based format. Once the course ended, the researchers determined whether the students passed the course uh, with an A, B, and C or not. The goal of the study was to determine whether the proportion of students who passed the lab-based format exceeded that of the lecture format. We have two groups. We have 1,200 in a traditional lecture and 300 in a lab base. And this is just how they registered for the courses. This is random. This is going to be an independent sample. And we are discussing the proportion who passed. So proportion is a numeric value. If we read what it says here, the sampling method is independent because the individuals in the lecture are not related to the individuals in the lab course. The response variable is whether the students pass the course or not. So we're checking for the proportion that passed. Because there's two outcomes, pass or do not pass, the researcher can compare the proportion of students passing the lecture course to those passing the lab-based course. Are products purchased on Amazon less expensive than those purchased online at Walmart? To answer this question, researchers randomly identified 20 products sold at both stores and determined the selling price at Amazon and the online Walmart store to determine if there was a significant difference in the price of goods. Here, we have identified 20 products that are at both locations. So, Price at Amazon is being compared to price at Walmart. These are considered dependent samples because one is dependent on the other. We are comparing one directly to its other. 
the price at Amazon compared directly to the price at Walmart. Okay, and the response variable is price, which is also quantitative. <clears throat> so a number. So let's go through the process here of how we are actually going to see these hypotheses problems, how we're going to test them, and go from there. Suppose a simple random sample of size N1 is taken from a population where X1 of the individuals have a specified characteristic. And a simple random sample of size N2 is independently taken from a different population where X2 of the individuals have a specified characteristic. So we have X1 out of N1, and we're going to compare that to X2 over N2. Okay, the sampling distribution of P1 hat minus P2 hat, this is P1 hat, X over N, P2 hat, X over N, is going to be approximately normal with our mean, P1 minus P2, and standard deviation with this lovely formula. Again, don't need to worry about that part. So provided that we double check NP times one and minus P is greater than 10 for both samples, and each sample is no more than 5% of the population. All right, remember that anytime we do these, every problem I'm gonna give you, this is automatically going to be, it is going to work. I could find the standardized version here if we were doing this by hand. We're not going to do any of this by hand. So again, we will just pass through here. The best point estimate of P is called the pooled estimate of P, denoted as P hat, where you take X1 plus X2 all over N1 plus N2. And some more formulas that we don't need to really worry about. How do we do this? To test hypotheses regarding two population proportions, P1 and P2, we are going to do the following. We have to make sure that the samples are independently obtained using random sampling. We can check for n p times n times p times one minus p is greater than or equal to ten. I'm telling you, this will work for the ones I give you. And again, this will work here. All right, every single one that I give you, these will all be able to be checked. You can just say yes, they work. Once you're done, you can create your hypotheses. Do we believe that the, so our null hypothesis is always going to be that the proportions are equal. There's no difference between the two proportions. Then our alternate is, okay, they're not equal or one is significantly smaller than the other. So P1 is smaller than P2 or P1 is greater than P2. So three ways in which we can write our hypotheses, like we've done every other time, three ways to write our hypotheses with not equal to less than and greater than. We will have a level of significance. We will use our stat crunch to calculate the p value. If p is less than alpha, we will reject the null hypothesis and state our conclusion. It's always easier to understand it once we go through a full example here. In clinical trials of Nasonex, 3,774 adult and adolescent allergy patients who are 12 years and older were randomly divided into two groups. So there's your random, random independent samples, good. 3,774 adults with allergies is under 5% of the entire population in the world with allergies. The patients in group one received 200, I think that's micrograms. I think it's micrograms of Nasonex, while the patients in group two received a placebo. Of the 2,103 patients in the experimental group, 547 reported a headache. So here is sample one. <laughs> Of the 6, 1,671 patients in the control group, 368 reported headaches as a side effect. Let's only pick a different color here. 
So this is sample two. Is there evidence to conclude that the proportion of Nasonex users who experience headache as a side effect is greater than the proportion of the control group? So we want to know, is Nasonex greater than control? Nasonex was sample one. We want to know, is P1 greater than P2? And here's our level of significance. So I will always kind of pick out the information that I need here. We will verify, promise that they work. They are independent. We have X1, N1, X2, and N2, so we can double check here. The first proportion is 547 out of 2103 and 368 out of 1671. And I could do my NP times 1 minus P to make sure that they're greater than 10. And I told you this will always work um, with the ones that I give you. There are clearly more than 10 million Americans who have allergies, so these are smaller than 5%. We can move on with the rest of our process. Step one, is the proportion of patients taking Nasonex who experience a headache greater than the proportion of patients taking the placebo? We let P1 represent our proportion of Nasonex users and P2 represent the placebo. So we want to check is P1 greater than P2, and that is the alternate hypothesis. Null hypothesis is that they are equal. Alternate is that P1 is greater than P2. Or you could rewrite it as P1 minus P2 equals zero, and P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. So let's explain that. If I were to subtract P2 from this side and move it over, I get this equation. Same over here, if I subtract a larger minus a smaller is gonna keep it larger than zero. Five is bigger than two. Five minus two is bigger than zero. So either way that you wanna write it is fine here. I always default to this top one. And our level of significance is 0.05. The next thing we're going to do is we are going to go to StatCrunch here. So let me show you where we go for StatCrunch. We're going to go to Stat. We have proportions. We're going to proportion stats again, but we have a two sample summary. 547. 547 out of 2103 and 368 out of 1671. Okay. We want our test to be greater than symbol. And we will click compute. So once again, everything is all here. All of our information is here. We are looking for the p-value over here, so 0 0.0023. Let me get back to where we were here. Give me a second. Okay, 0 0.002 is what this one shows. I had 0 0.0023. So we're going to compare that to our alpha value. 0 0.0023 is smaller than our alpha of 0.05. So we will reject the null hypothesis. Just to understand here, this p-value means that if the null hypothesis or p1 minus p2 is true, we would expect only two samples out of a thousand because two is in the thousandth place, tenths, hundredths, thousandth, so two out of a thousand give us the results that we obtained. That is not very common. So our results are clearly significant enough that we can reject the null hypothesis. And what does that mean? There is sufficient evidence at our 0.05 level 
include the proportion of individuals 12 years old and older taking the Nasonex who experience headache is greater than the proportion of those taking the placebo getting headaches. Okay, I understand that this is one, two, three, four, five sentences long. You do not necessarily have to type all of that every time. <clears throat> I would probably say there is sufficient evidence to say the proportion of individuals 12 and older taking Nasonex who get headaches is greater than the proportion of 12 year old and older taking the placebo getting headache. So, I mean, there's ways you can kind of shorten it a little bit it may not be a whole ton, but there are a few ways to kind of shorten the conclusion sentence. Prevnar. The drug Prevnar is a vaccine meant to prevent certain types of bacterial meningitis, typically administered to infants around two months of age. In a randomized double-blind clinical trials of Prevnar, infants were randomly divided into two groups. Subjects in group one received Prevnar. So Prevnar, and we're gonna have a placebo. Uh, well, subjects two received the control vaccine. After the first dose, 107 out of 710 in group one had a fever. After the first dose in the second group, 67 out of 611 had a fever. So does the evidence suggest that a higher proportion of subjects in group one experienced fever over group two? So we want to know, is this one bigger than that one? Okay, they are random. These are very small sample sizes compared to the entire population of infants. So we are going to be able to run this test. Null hypothesis is that the two proportions are equal. The alternate is that our first proportion is greater than our second proportion. From here, we are going to go to stat crunch and I need to get the p value. I'm going to compare that to alpha. Alpha is 0.05. Every time we do these, we are still going to stats, proportion stats. The only difference now we have two proportions and not one or two samples. Stat. Proportion stats, but now I'm going to two samples and I have a summary. I have 107 out of 710. I have 67 out of 611. And that one stats S greater than. My p value here is 0 0.0139. That's all I need from here, 0 0.0139. Zeros are the same, one is smaller than five. So P is less than alpha. When P is less than alpha, we reject the null. When we reject the null, there is enough evidence to claim right here, a higher proportion of group one experienced fever as a side effect than group two. I'm basically taking what it's asking me here. Does this suggest, well, it says, we have enough evidence to make this claim. In October 1947, the Gallup organization surveyed 1,110 adult Americans. All right, 1,100 adult Americans. Are you a total abstainer from or do you on occasion consume alcoholic beverages? Of the 1,100 adults surveyed, 
407 indicated that they were total abstainers. In a recent survey, the same question was asked of a new 1,100 people and found that 333 of them were total abstainers. Has the proportion of adult Americans who totally abstain from alcohol changed? They're not asking us as one bigger than the other. They are just asking, are they different? So if they are different, we are testing not equals. Are null, P1 equals P2. Our alternate that we want to find out is, are they different? Is P1 not equal P2? We're just gonna go through here. Our P value, we gotta calculate. Alpha is 0.05. If you want to double check on the side, clearly there are more than 1,110 um, adult Americans. We have millions and millions of Americans. So this is smaller than 5%. If you want to test the N, P, 1 minus P, greater than or equal to 10, you can test that if you want. I'm telling you right now it works. It does track off for all of the ones we're doing. I pre-did that so that we didn't have to do that step here. In your homework, if it asks you in Pearson, just double check it. Say, yep, it works. Yep, it works. And then move on to the actual So stats, proportion stats, we have two samples, summary. All right, I got 407 out of 1100 and 333 out of 1100. I am testing not equals two, so that symbol is correct. And I'm gonna click compute. My p-value here is 0 0.0008. That is clearly smaller than 0.05, so we can reject the null. And if we reject the null, there is enough evidence to claim the proportion of adult Americans who totally abstain from alcohol has changed. Again, so I'm just taking the sentence here. It's asking, has it changed? Well, we either do or do not have enough evidence to show that it's changed. And in this case, we do. We reject the null. There is enough evidence to make the claim that the proportion of adult Americans who totally abstain from alcohol has changed. All your wording for your sentences is there. Hypothesis testing, still the same. What we can also do is construct a confidence interval for the difference between our two proportions. Construct our confidence interval. Again, you got to double check the same things that we did. Are they independent samples? Does NP times 1 minus P give me a value greater than 10? And are your samples uh, no more than 5% of the entire population? All of these will be satisfied with the questions that I am giving you. Just like last time, I'm gonna show you the lovely formulas. And now that we've added a second variable, the formulas have gotten larger, longer, messier, which is why we do not do these by hand. But you can see here, this is how you find the lower bound. And this is how you would find the upper bounds. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of calculating here. Again, which is why we are going to use stat crunch instead. Please, please, please do not try to do these by hand. It's really not worth it. The Gallup organization surveyed 1,110 adult Americans on May 6th through 9th and then conducted an independent survey of 1,024 adult Americans on May 1st through 10th of 2018. In both surveys, they asked the following. Right now, do you think the state of moral values in this country as a whole is getting better or worse? In the first group, 
and that, sorry, on the May 1 through 10 in 2018, we had 784 of the 1024 stated that it's getting worse. On the May 6 to 9th from 2002, we had 773 out of the uh, 1,100 who said it's getting worse. So let's construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the difference between the two proportions. We are going to verify. I will show you here that it all works in the homework. You can just check that it works. You can just check off that, yes, it works. Okay, it says they were independently simple. First group, 784 out of 1024 is 0. 0.766. And the second sample, 737 out of 1100 is 0. 0.67. So I could go on and calculate NP times 1 minus P. And both of them are going to be greater than or equal to 10. And lastly, the entire adult population is over 10, 100 million. Clearly, our sample sizes are small. Same thing, same place that we are going to go to in SatCrunch every single time is these proportion stats. Two sample summary. This one had, I need to go back a page to get my fractions. There they are. All right, 784 out of 1024 and 737 out of 1100. Instead of doing a hypothesis test, we are doing a confidence interval. Was it 90? 90% confidence interval. What's the difference between this two? This is another spit out of the answer here. So let's change this to 90%, point 90, and click compute. 0 0.06372. A point one two seven five three. That's the same thing right here. Our interval is that value point oh six three seven two to point one two seven five three. How do we interpret this? Well, before we always we're gonna follow kind of a general guideline here. So we are fill in the blank confident, 90% confident. We are asking about the difference between these two proportions. So the difference between the proportion of adult Americans who think morally it is worse uh, from what were the years 2002 to 2018 is between 0. 0.06 I'm going to go for and 0. 0.128 what does this really mean? From 2002 to 2018, there is between a 6.4% and 12.8% difference in the amount of people that believe moral, morally, how we are getting morally worse. So there is a difference in those proportions. Okay, this is the difference between 6.4% and 12.8%. That is the difference that we found between 2002 and 2018 and how confident they are and how, how they feel morally we are as a country. On the next slide here, 
it, it kind of repeats what I said here. So we are 90% confident that the difference between the proportions of adult Americans who believe the state of moral values in the country as a whole was getting worse from 2002 to 2018 is between those two values. To put this statement into everyday language, we might say that we're 90% confident that the percentage of adult Americans who believe the state of moral values in the country as a whole was getting worse increased somewhere between 6.4 and 12.8% between those two years. Because this interval does not contain zero, we might conclude that the higher proportion of the country believed the state of moral values was getting worse is in 2018. So just like we did before, a confidence interval and a hypothesis test are gonna have the same outcome. These results here are showing because the interval does not contain zero, if I were to run a hypothesis test here, we would see that our P1 is greater than P2. We would have significant enough information to do that. So let me show you really quick, because I know we've talked about it a little bit, but I want to remind you of how we go together. I want to double check here, is P1 bigger than P2? If I look at my p-value, my p-value is very, very small. So my p-value is very, very small. So it shows that there is a difference. That, that p1, that 2018 value is bigger than the 2002 value. So Americans in 2018, clearly there's a difference where they think, more of them think, sorry, that as a whole, we're morally worse. In March of 2003, the Pew Research Group surveyed 1,508 adult Americans and asked, do you believe the United States made the right or wrong decision to use military force in Iraq? First group, 2003, 1508. Of 1508 adult Americans surveyed, 1,086 stated that they made the right decision. In August of 2010, the Pew Research Group asked the same question of a new group of 1508 adult Americans and found that 618 now believe they made the right decision. So I just want you to look at these really quick here. We went from 1086 out of 1508 to 618 out of 1508. It clearly looks based on numbers that this first group was a lot higher than the second group. What we should see is that there is a difference between those, and then we're going to figure out about how much difference could we expect if we had had access to the entire population. In the survey question, the choices right and wrong were randomly rotated. Why? Anytime they give an option in um, a question. So what they're saying here is they would ask half the people, do you believe the United States made the right or wrong decision? to use military force in Iraq. And then the other half, they would say, do you believe the United States made the wrong or right decision to use military force in Iraq? They do this just to make sure that they're not providing any form of bias. They wanna make sure they have an accurate representation of the data. So they'll flip flop the wording if it's a choice like that, just to make sure that there's no bias. So let's go now and actually construct our interval for 2003 and 2010. Stats, reports and stats, few samples, summary, 1086 out of 1508, 618 out of 1508. Confidence interval, um, let's say 90%. We have about 282.339. We are 90% confident. The difference 
in the proportion of Americans who thought we made the right decision for Iraq between, what do we have, 2003 and 2010 is, let me write our numbers, 0.282 and 0.339. Here's what that really means. From 2003 to 2010, sorry, there is a 28.2% to 33.9% change in the proportion of the Americans who thought we made the right decision. when it came to Iraq. So this is the technical way we write it. We are such and such as quite confident that the difference in the proportion of fill in whatever it is you're talking about is fill in your interval, okay? What does that really mean here? Well, it's telling me the percent difference or percent change here. This is clearly bigger than this. And if I were to run a hypothesis test, I would see that this statistically is bigger than this. It definitely went down. And this is the difference. Somewhere between 28 and almost 34% difference in what they believed when we first went to war and almost se 10 years late, seven years later. I'll do one more. So in a recent Harris Interactive survey, uh, respondents were asked, how acceptable is divorce to you personally? So in the first group, 834 out of 970 found it to be acceptable. Who, uh, sorry, this was in the religious group. Among 12,085 who were not religious, 1,157 considered it to be acceptable. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval. One more confidence interval, and then we will go to uh, sample size here. Proportion to sample summary. You're going to get real familiar with where these buttons are. <laughs> 834 out of 970. And 11.57 out of 12.85. We want a 95% confidence interval. And we're going to click compute. This one gave us negative answers. So remember that sometimes we do get negative answers. That is just telling us that the... Second value was higher than the first one. So if I were to change these into decimals really quick here, it will make a little more sense. So 834, 834 out of 970 is 0.8, roughly about 0.86, 1157 out of 1285. Oops. I hit the right button, 0.90. So this one is smaller than this one, and that is why our interval is showing up as negative values. So let me get those back up. 0 0.067, 0 0.013. These are both negative, so that means significantly we have a difference here. If it goes from a negative to a positive, it includes zero. And our hypothesis, we would have to not reject the null. When we have two positives or two negatives, we have shown a significant, significant 
difference, and this one rejects the null, and they are not equal. One is clearly bigger or smaller than the other. So what does this mean? Uh, oops, sorry. We are 95% confident the difference in proportions of religious and non-religious uh, people who believe divorce is acceptable is between negative 0.067 and negative 0 0.013. What does that mean for us? We can be about 90% confident that religious are somewhere between 6.7 and 1.3% less likely to say divorce is acceptable. So this one's the smaller one. So the religious is about somewhere between 6.7 and 1.3% below the non-religious people. There's that sort of a difference there. Last thing we're going to do for this section is sample size. Here is the lovely formula. If you have a prior estimate, here is the formula if you do not have prior estimates. Prior estimates. In StatCrunch, we are going to enter our P1 and our P2. If we do not have prior estimates, uh, both P1 and P2 are set to 0.5. Okay. I'll show you that in a minute here. All right, a nutritionist wants to estimate the difference between the proportion of males and females who consume the USDA's recommended daily intake of calcium. What sample size should be obtained if she wishes the estimate to be within three percentage points with a 95% confidence, assuming part A, we have two prior estimates. What you could do is you could do this all by hand. I do not recommend doing it by hand because it's messy. I will show you it on the next slide here. Our error is 0.03, and you would have to find the z-score for a 95% confidence. So we had a table, 90 was 1.654, 95 is 1.96, we had 98 and 99%. All those values were listed on the slide. So well, you don't have to go back and look at it. Instead, I mean, you could do this if you want and work your entire formula out here and type in P1 times 1 minus P1 plus P2, 1 minus P2, and all of this messy stuff. But it gets really messy inside of a calculator. We have StatCrunch at our help, at our hand to help us. So proportions. Two samples, I want a width sample size. This is exactly where we went before for one sample. Our confidence level is 95%. First proportion, 0.511. Second proportion, 0.752. Now, width. We need to double the width. So remember our error was 3%, but error goes up 3% and back 3% for a total of 6%, so 0 0.06.
And if you look, this answer is going to map here because this rounds up to 1863. So our stat crunch gave me all the math, did all of it for me right there. Okay, B, if you do not have any prior estimates, what you are changing are your proportion values. When you do not have prior information, both proportions are set back to their default of 0.5. And again, I'm going to change that to 0 0.06. It always changes it a little bit to make sure you get the nice round number. So. 2,135 should be the answer, and it is, doing it by um, hand. Okay, again, I don't ever do these by hand. There is no reason to do them by hand. Use the tools at your disposal. The doctor wants to estimate the difference in the proportion of 15 to 19 year old mothers that receive prenatal care and the proportion of 30 to 34 year old mothers that receive prenatal care. What sample size should be obtained if she wishes the estimate to be within two percentage points with the 95% confidence interval? 0.95 is our confidence. Our error is 2% or 0 0.02, which we need to double to create the width, 0.04. We have prior information here. 98% of 15 to 19 year old mothers receive prenatal care, so 0 0.98. To 99.2 or 0.992 of 30 to 34 year old mothers receive prenatal care. All right, so I'm going to go back here. We still want 95% interval. We got 0.98. We got 0.992, oops, and our width is 0.04. This says we should sample 265. When it asks about no prior estimates, we are going to go back to P1 and P2 being their default of 0.5. And this is going to increase the sample size the largest possible sample that would be needed. I would never have to go above this. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, I want to re put 0 0.04 there. 4,802 is how many I would need now. Clearly, if I have previous information, I don't have to sample as many than if I don't have any information at all. All right, so I hope that makes sense. We're going to keep moving on here with some means. So I'll see you in the next video.